Have you ever seen the film um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Absolutely. And uh, yeah. our audience should not panic. Whatever you say next, <laughs> they should not panic. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt, the host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for CX leaders looking to drive improvement by focusing on their CX and culture together. I'm excited to be here today with Colin Shaw, who is the author of four best-selling books, including The Intuitive Cu Customer, which is also the name of his podcast. Uh, welcome for, uh, to the podcast, Colin. It's great to be with you. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, thank you for having us on. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, you know, I mentioned your book, The Intuitive Customer, which I really enjoyed uh, reviewing. Uh, and folks who want to check out that review can see that on screen now. Uh, and I find this book uh, really powerful along the lines of others that I really enjoyed, like with you know Danny Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, The Power of Habit, and others. It's, it's really a very strong book about the importance of emotion and unconscious thought in how shoppers behave, how consumers behave. Uh, do you want to share a little bit more about the book and, and some, of the, um, the, some of the key ideas that um, led you to write the book and then where you've been focused? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think the first thing to say is it's sort of a bit of a, an evolution. Uh, so I wrote my first book back in 2002, which I addressed the show that I'm very old now. Um, our own customer experience. And within there, we, we talked about the sort of really two aspects of customer experience, um, which is what I would call the, the rational things. In other words, the things that people do, uh, and then the emotional things, i.e. the emotion that people, uh, evoke where, what I've realized over the years, uh, as I've, as I've sort of looked into this subject more is you then have to look at why why emotions are being evoked and therefore to do that you start to look into this whole area of behavioral science so looking at um the fact for instance that we human beings like to think of ourselves as being logical animals um, but we're far from it um we are very illogical in, in all of our decision or a lot of our decision making uh, and therefore starting to delve into that and that's how the 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 book the intuitive customer manifested itself i co-authored it with a guy called professor ryan hamilton who teaches behavioral science out of uh, emory university and to be totally honest we had such a good laugh um just learning about all this stuff and everything else that we they created the podcast uh, and that's been going for the last six years um and it's really trying to understand why people do things and the the irony, Matt, is that, um, and this sort of becomes a bit counterintuitive for customer experience people like ourselves, um, that sometimes you shouldn't listen to what customers tell you, uh, because sometimes they don't know why they do things themselves, uh, and, and therefore trying to get under the skin of why people do things, and therefore how to design a, a, a customer, an effective customer experience uh, based upon that that knowledge. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, it reminds me a lot of um, Paco Underhill, who's a, a very well known in the ethnography space that you have to watch people it's, and you really have to observe them. Yogi Berra says you observe a lot by watching, which is, uh, I think, a great expression, one of his uh, interesting twists of the phrase. But like you, to your point, people don't always know why they do things. And it's not necessarily that they're irrational, although there is certainly an element of that where, you know, people are using simplifying devices, right? But that they're, they're it's below the surface. It's unconscious. They're not aware of why they're doing things and they rationalize it afterwards. Yes, no, absolutely. The, the example I always use, because it's, I think it sort of highlights the issue, is that Disney know when they ask their customers what they want to eat at a theme park, Disney know that people say they'd like to have an option of a salad. Uh, Disney also know that people don't eat salad to think box, the hot dogs and hamburgers. So what people say that they want and what people say that they will do can be extremely different to what they end up doing for many different reasons. You know, some of which are just societal 
Um, they don't want to admit things. Uh, some some of it is just simply because they don't realise those sort of hidden hidden motivations. And it's an important aspect of customer experience to get under the skin of that and and really understand what people do and what they value. Well, in your in your book, um, you and Ryan talk about how organizations hit a plateau. And how that often companies, you know, aren't getting as much out of their investment in customer experience or insights or innovation or wherever they're focusing their energy. And they're hitting a plateau because they're too focused on the rational side of things and not understanding the intuitive customer. Can you explain a little more what you mean by a plateau? And, and then what do companies need to do to evolve their approach to insights to break out of that plateau? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, a, a plateau for me is, is you're reaching a, you know, a point where you're not making progress. And I think if you look at what's happened in the CX industry over the last few years, you're starting to see that, okay, with, um, you know, lots of organizations not making the progress that they need to make or want to make and not getting the ROI. Um, and that is because I think what's happening is people are focused on the on the wrong things. So the issue is that it's very easy to focus on the rational things because rational things are easy to identify. Um, they, you know, we've known about them for, for years. And therefore, people go around trying to fix those things. But those typically tend to be the symptom um, rather than the source of the, you know, the cause of the of the problem. And therefore, again, I, I think that what you need to do is you need to look at what drives value. And that's a key thing for me, uh, which is what are the things that will improve your CX metrics. So what are the things that will improve net promoter or the customer effort score or whatever metrics that you, you may have. And when you start to look at that, what you realize is that it's not necessarily the things that are that customers tell you. So let me give you an example. Um, we did some work for one of the large, um, uh, construction equipment manufacturers. And, you know, so when you looked at construction equipment, roughly tufty area, um, where, you know, when you looked at the key drivers, then they're, they're, they're the drivers you would expect them to be. So, you know, is the product priced correctly? Um, am I getting value for money? Will I get a, a decent uh, amount on return? How quickly are parts available? Those types of, and I would call those the rational things. When we did some research, what we discovered was that those weren't the things that actually drove value. What actually drove value was, does the, does the organization care for me as a person? Okay. So even though, again, it's in that construction industry and you're now starting to talk about customer emotions, um, those were the things that drove value. So the interesting bit then becomes, well, how do you go about actually getting people to care for you as a person and what are the things that you should be doing and what are the things that you shouldn't be doing and those are a bit more nebulous i guess is the challenge i really um want to come back to a point you made just for the audience um it resonated with me colin which is some of the things are symptoms versus really the the deeper meaning the thing that's really driving that value that emotional connection that what the meaning to the customer is part of what creates that stronger memory and that stronger emotional connection, as you're pointing out. And the the symptoms you're highlighting, there could be lots of pain points. There could be lots of things that you're finding people are commenting on. And if you go fix those, that may move the needle a little bit, but you're not really addressing the most important underlying things that establish that stronger emotional connection. Is that, did I capture that? Okay. Uh, so let me, let me try. So yes, you did. Uh, let me try sort of embellish that a bit as well further. So the issue for me is, you know, I, I'm a businessman. Okay. M my number one issue is what drives value. So if I've got a dollar to spend, 
where do I spend it to get the most return? And the irony is that where I spend it may not be on the things that customers are complaining about or giving me feedback about. Okay. I may actually get a better return in a different area. So caring for me as a person, for instance, as opposed to improving the product reliability, because the reality is that the, these particular clients reliability was pretty bloody good. And, you know, it's like 99% on, um, uh, and therefore, you know, increasing it by 0.1% becomes a big issue. Whereas you could actually gain much more value by looking at that emotional side. So I have a dollar to spend. Where do I get the biggest return? It's not necessarily in fixing the things that are wrong. It could be in the area that drives an opportunity. And those things aren't being looked at. We, we have an obsession with looking at things that are wrong. And let me be clear. I'm not saying you shouldn't look at them. I'm just saying that you should look at them in comparison to the opportunity areas as well. So if you looked at something like, you know, loyalty, okay. Loyalty is a massive, um, driver of emotion. I mean, we, you know, we are loyal to things means that we, we have a, you know, loyalty is an emotional attachment. If you think about driving, doing something that drives loyalty over a number of year, years, what's the ROI of that? It's massive. This is a theme that, um, has come up with a number of conversations I've had with other guests um, about positive emotion versus fixing pain and how there's actually different parts of the brain that are activated for pain and fixing negative experiences versus friendship and loyalty and love and relationships. It's actually a different part of the brain. Uh, so you don't create loyalty by reducing pain. No, I mean, it's <laughs> the, the example I always use is this, um, you know, uh, I, I, who are you loyal to in your life? Okay. Most people are loyal to their family and their friends. If I was to turn around to you and say, uh, I've got this really cheap flam family to run. There are a lot cheaper to run than your existing family, but cost a lot less. Yeah. Uh, would you swap? Okay. And yeah, sometimes some people do it, uh, but most time people, people don't. Okay. Um, so loyalty is an emotional attachment. Those, we also know that your wife, your kids can do things that really annoy you <laughs> and really frustrate you, but you love them. Okay. So I think the issue for me is you've got to get more granular than just talking about positive and negative emotions. So my third book, a DNA of customer experience, uh, was about how emotions drive value. And we looked at some, uh, we did two years worth of research with London business school to identify, and this is all in the book as well, in the intuitive customer book, and uh, to identify which emotions drive and destroy value. So, you know, uh, you rightly set back, you know, things that like words like love, Okay. Words like cared for, valued, happy, you know, and then on the negative side, frustrated, um, uh, and you know, unsatisfied, et cetera, et cetera. Those are specific things that you can start to target to, uh, to move your customer experience forward. In your book and your podcasts, Colin, um, you talk a lot about not just emotion, but memory, you know, and, and, uh, yeah, and, and how those come together to shape loyalty, as you were just mentioning. You also talk about the peak end theory and about how in, in a customer journey, what's memorable are the peaks and the ends and all that other stuff in between that may be not as pronounced. It's efficient for our brain to filter out the mem moments, right? How, how does the peak end theory apply to better understand what shapes memory and customer experience. I'm glad you asked me this because this is my favorite topic. Um, and the, uh, the, this is probably, I would say this is probably the biggest thing I've learned over the last 10 or 15 years. Okay. And this is not me talking about this. This is Daniel Kahneman. 
And he talks about the fact that we as human beings, when you start to think about how our memory is formed, okay, we start to think about uh, what's called, as you say, the peak end rule, okay? So the peak end rule basically refers to in your experience, when you have an experience, what is the what we tend to remember is we remember the peak emotion that we felt, and that peak can be positive or negative. Um, and we tend to remember the end emotion that they felt. Okay. And those are the things. So if I said to you, tell me about a holiday that you've a uh, vacation that you've been on. Okay. You know, what was the last vacation? You you undoubtedly tell me about some you know good good things or your overall memory. Okay. If you think about loyalty, okay, you can't be loyal to something without having a memory of it. Okay. You know, uh by definition, loyalty is about memory. And therefore what we have to do is we have to start to understand how those memories are formed. So therefore, a key question comes out of it, which is, so where is the peak emotion that you are feeling, your customers are feeling, and what emotion are they feeling at that peak? Yeah. Um, what, what's the positive, what's the negative emotion? And again, trying to be specific about those. What are your customers feeling at the end of their experiences? Because Kahneman talks about the fact that endings are exceptionally important. And the danger is that we rush endings, okay? Um, and and we, we, we rush endings far too much. And the third important question is, which emotion drives the most value for you? So again, we tend to look at that sort of the rational thing, and we know that if you increase the number of features and all the rest of it, we're going to get this much. Well, how much revenue are we going to gain if we're evoking cared for or trust um, or feeling pampered or whatever that emotion may be, okay? Um, because without that strategic direction, where are you heading? And therefore, when you're laying your customer journey out, when we lay our customer journey out, we're looking at the peaks and what the end is, and we're trying to match that against what the strategy of that organization should be, because we know that drives value, uh, i.e. you're getting that return uh, return on things. So memory is in, in everything that we, we do. I'd love to build on something you said um, and uh, get your, your thoughts on this too, Colin. A lot of times when people engage in customer experience improvement efforts, they'll use personas and journeys as a tool to understand where those peaks are in the journey and to see how they differ across personas and then as part of painting a story about the persona, they'll talk about the emotions that the persona feels, you know, at moments in the journey. Now, it's an important point. I want to get your thoughts on this. Oh, I think too often when people use personas and journeys, they're actually focusing on what's different about the personas, which is useful to design different experiences and not enough on what's common about the personas, because what we're talking about here are the deeper meaning for how human beings engage in a category and a brand in the category and the stories they're telling themselves about the category and how they organize memory is through metaphors and it's through storytelling. And actually often the insights you have about our category are what's common about the, 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 the what, what people feel and the brand, the brand promise that, and how you want people to feel to reinforce that brand promise is actually what's common across the personas, not what's different about them. But all too often, people focus on just writing a few words about emotions to make the persona feel a little bit more granular when it doesn't do justice to the topic. 
No, no, I agree. I mean, I I like the fact that personas are really there for communication and are there for, and we've both done it today, um, giving me examples. You know, people like to hear a story and an example because that makes it live for them, okay? The good thing about a persona is if done in the right way, it can make that type of customer live for the person. But that's all it does, okay? And then it depends upon how deep the organization has gone into understanding that persona and whether they've, again, just looked at it from a very superficial level uh, and has gone, you know, and this is Mary and she does this and, you know, she's got two kids and all that stuff, which is fine, uh, but they need to get under the skin of those things. Um, and the same with a, with a journey, okay? The, you know, we're not going deeply enough into, into customer, into understanding the true customer journey and why people are making decisions along that journey. And that rolls in this whole area of, of behavioral science and getting down into the detail of things. So I think tones are a great way of communicating. They just typically, they lack a lot of detail that falls behind it. So to go deeper then about where you want to go deeper. You talk about the need to get deeper and build build more meaningful insights that allows you to understand the intuitive side of things, the emotional side of things, what's really shaping memory and loyalty. What type of research or insights do you see as most valuable for companies to engage in to get that additional level of depth? Yeah, so there's a couple that, that I particularly like. One is, you've already mentioned it, uh, ethnographics looking at what people do uh and if there was one thing that i would say for people to, to to think about from this podcast is don't just look at what customers say watch what they do because that's very in, insightful and understand then why they're doing things the second one that, that that we use a hell of a lot is the difference is um correlation research and you can you can uh, Google this afterwards, but we use a, a special form of research called structural equation modeling, which looks at causation, okay? So there's, most organizations look at correlation, which is, so this stat is affected by this stat, you know, and they, they correlate, so they're probably the same, yeah, or, or influencing each other. Whereas causation looks at the cause of things, so it gets down underneath things. So um, we talk about it in the book, but there's um, uh, what we call an emotional signature, which looks at three aspects, which is what's the customer doing? How's that making them feel? And then what drives value? So there were sort of three levers there. So you can see the correlation yeah, and the causation between the, the you're doing this, yeah, uh, and it's have, it's making customers feel frustrated, which is then having the cause of reducing your net promoter score or your revenue or your market share or whatever it may be. So when I'm going out as a business person and I'm pulling these levers, I know which lever to pull, which again ties into the previous conversation, which is it's, you know, some of the things I could pull as a lever, maybe the things that are where customers are complaining. And, you know, here's a list of things that customer complain about. But, hey, look, look, if I was to fix those things, that actually only affects X amount of, I will only gain X amount more revenue. Whereas if I fix these things or if I, have, if I start caring for my customer, actually those have got three times the amount of, uh, of value and therefore that's what I should do. I should effectively prioritize my dollar to spend on fixing the things that gives me most value and that's causation research i'd love to um uh connect that to some of the language people use in the industry to describe the types of data analysis they do and and comment on how what you're doing adds more rigor and more structure 
to what I think people are doing either not enough or more haphazardly often. Um, often, um, I, I think of there being three types of data and it's how you link them and use them that's most important, which is what you're doing with your structural equations. Um, there's experience data, operational data, and outcome data. So experience, uh, outcomes are arguably really important because that's the value that you, an outcome ultimately is how you measure progress. And NPS is not a very, um, it's, it's a means to an end. It is actually not the outcome itself that you want. If you, if you, if it's a measure of advocacy, which could translate through to other business outcomes, but if all you measured with NPS, it's actually only somewhat correlated with other outcomes. You have to combine it with other data to link it more as you were commenting to the outcomes. I'm not saying it's not useful. It's just not enough on its own. Right. Um, and then, um, but the other outcomes are more tangible business metrics. Like, are you driving a second or repeat, other repeat purchase? Uh, are you, are you getting somebody to engage in certain behaviors that lower your cost to serve? You know, and you could go on on the revenue or the cost side, specific outcomes that you want. They're tangible business metrics, but those are all outcomes. And what you want to know is what causes the outcomes to your point. And, and, and there's a difference between experience and operational data. Experience data is what people are thinking, feeling, and saying. And you, you measure that through surveys. You measure that through unstructured data, like text analytics of calls and texts and social media. Um, and then operational data, to your point, is what people are doing. These are people's digital footprints. It's a way of measuring what people are actually doing. And the doing is what creates the feeling, to your point. But a lot of the times, these data sets are used not in a connected way and not in a very intentional way to understand the causation of outcomes. So it's very suboptimal. Yeah, no, and I, I, I like those three things that you've mentioned there. I, I think the, the issue for me is that, you know, we know that emotions count for a large part of your experience and how you make decisions. We okay? go and, and, you know, you're right in saying that's in that experience side of things, but in my view, m many organizations don't really understand how their customers feel and don't understand the emotions they're feeling. And therefore, it's a huge part of their data that they're missing out on. And as they then move, then we haven't even touched on this, but as people move into the world of AI and the, the training of their, um, you know, the, the training of their uh, AI systems, you know, they're not, they're not thinking, and this goes back to this classic, yeah, they're not thinking about human behavior and customer emotions well enough. And they don't have the data to be able to put into their learning models, to be able to create AI, to be able to, for it, to be able to predict what customers are doing. It's a bit like, um, have you ever seen the film, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. our audience should not panic. Whatever you say exactly. next, or they should not panic. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, in there is one of my favorite films. Uh, and books, and it talks about the, do you remember when um, they asked Deep Thought, okay, um, what is the answer to life, the universe, and everything? And Deep Thought, which is this big uh, AI machine, goes away for seven and a half million years, and it comes up with the answer. And the answer is 42. So the answer to life, the universe, and everything is 42. Now, the problem that we're getting to is this. I think that without having that uh, emotional data being fed into the AI systems, they're gonna the AI is gonna come up with an answer of forty two for people, and they're just not gonna be able to understand the answer. Okay, uh, and it's a bit like um, you know, um, yeah, it, it's a bit like you know, be careful what you look for because you'll you'll find it. So the danger is is they're they're gonna come up with the answer and not understand the answer, which goes back to that plateauing, which is there's not enough people that are understanding this stuff. Okay. Uh, and being able to get into this level of detail and conversation 
to be able to start to predict what customers are doing. So part of that is getting people in CX, their knowledge levels up to just embrace the fact that it's not just rational and a little bit of emotion, but there's this whole area around customer behavior that you go understand as well to be able to understand why customers are doing things and why customers are feeling things. You got to ask the right questions. And by the way, you picked one of my favorite books that I Good. actually quoted in my high school yearbook is one of my oh. quotes. <laughs> what, what, did you, what did you quote in the high, high uh, Let's see if yearbook. I can get the memory right. Just a few years later, um, right. people were increasingly of the opinion that it was a mistake to have come down from the trees and perhaps we should never have left the oceans in the first place. That's that's that. Yes, I remember that one. Yeah, so, and the plane was just about to blow up, and they say, "Good, the, all the dolphins left." Who's the highest form of intelligence? Good right. boy, Mackey for all the fish. Yep, yep. <laughs> that was a great book. I'll have to go read that one again. It was a lot yep. of fun. Um, so yeah, I love the emotional signature you you talked about, um, and, and and the importance of emotion. Um, I'd love to um, talk a little bit more about the human side of things, um, you know, and what the role of your frontline employees or, you know, people in the organization to deliver this experience that we're talking about. Well, it's funny. I was talking about it earlier today. It, again, there's part of me that, that thinks this is not rocky science. Okay. You know, uh, we've just been spending all of our time here talking about customers and understanding that there's rational and emotional and subconscious and psychological and behavioral science and, you know, what people say and what people do with everything. Well, guess what? Employees are the same. Okay. You know, um, what's the employee experience that you're trying to deliver? What emotions are you trying to, to evoke in your employees? Okay. What's the peak um, what's the peak end rule? You know, when you go home, when you go home at night, um, you know, what do you say to your, your partner? You know, what is, when they say, did you have a good day? Do you say, what do you say? Because that's a memory that has been built. That's been created by the peak end rule. So everything that we've just been talking about absolutely applies to everyone. Uh, you know, not just the, the front line. Um, but everybody in the organization. So you could, you could virtually take every tool that we have within, within the CX world and apply it to the, um, the employee experience world because you're dealing with a person. Well, and it's also the, if you look at the, all the experiences, all the memories you've had interacting with the brand, with the company, a lot of them involve interactions with other people. Right. And in, in fact, if you, um, you, I like to say we have fidgetal experiences. You don't make an experience a hundred percent digital. And while it's useful to use AI to personalize the experience and to train people and deliver more tailored experiences, you don't want to use AI just to automate and simplify and homogenize the experience where everyone gets the same experience. Um, so you know, I, I think that, you know, w this is a, a feature, not a bug of customer experience that there's human beings involved. Sure. No, I, I, I agree with you. I, I think again, the challenge I would throw in would be, so in those parts that we need to plug in the human being, which are the areas that like most value for us? Okay. And you know, how are we going to make those decisions? And again, which emotions are we trying to evoke and how are we going to design that experience with, with the, the person involved and the, uh, AI, whatever it may be, uh, to evoke those emotions. In, in fact, in B2B experiences, there's very ripe opportunity for emotional connection too, because what you're doing is a human being is reinforcing trust with another human being. A human being is delivering expertise and all of those experiences often have been based on relationships built up with other human beings that you're now trying to extend them into a digital 
whether it's a digital trade show, a virtual sales meeting, a product demo, you know, monitoring the supply chain performance, but these are all human, human interactions are still involved. You, you don't, you complement them with digital and there's still emotion and relationships involved. Yeah, no, I mean, one of the most common questions I've got over the three odd years I've been doing this stuff uh, has been, does this apply in B2B? Uh, and the answer is, yeah, you know, as long as you're being human beings, then yeah, it, it, everything applies. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, I find it quite ironic that when you talk to B2B organizations, rightly so, they say the relationship with the customer is key. And what is a relationship founded upon? It's founded upon, you know, understanding the customer emotions and all those other wonderful things. So it absolutely applies. One last question, Colin, is um, what are some of the lessons learned for culture and change management that CX leaders should focus on to better tap into the lessons learned from what we've been talking about today? I, again, I think that by by looking at, well, what drives value? So the first thing is we all know that culture change takes some time, okay? It's not a quick fix. Uh, and we all know that part of that, therefore, is that employee experience. And, you know, the things that always drive me nutty um, before I started my own business and used to work in corporate life was the difference between what they're trying to project outside and, and what they're trying to project inside. So those things should be absolutely aligned. So if you're trying to create trust and feeling cared for with a customer, then guess what? You should be trying to create, the leadership should be trying to create trust and the employees should be feeling cared for. So the alignment of those strategies uh, need, to, need to be in place. And then again, it's be clear about what drives value for your employees. You're not just doing culture change, um, you know, um, just for a laugh. You're trying to do it to gain gain something for the organization. And which of those things that are going to drive those outcomes of that, that culture change? When you've got to look into it in that human sense. Those are really good insights. Thanks for sharing them. Um, they uh, definitely are very relevant on a podcast called the CX and Culture Connection. Yeah, um, absolutely. Thank you for sharing them today and for sparking some great ideas for me and I'm sure for the audience, Colin. Um, you know, other than checking out your podcast and book, both called The Intuitive Customer, uh, mine are both called The CX and Culture Connection. So there maybe there's a lesson learned there is simplify your naming, right? <laughs> um, other than checking those out, um, what what can people do to kind of um, get in touch with you or um, you know get deeper into these topics? Yeah, just just look us up on LinkedIn is probably the best place. I'm very active on LinkedIn. Uh, I've got two hundred ninety three thousand followers on LinkedIn. I don't know why they follow me, but they do. Um, but, um, yeah, it just look us up on LinkedIn. Uh, we have a newsletter and various different things there. Thanks so much for your time, Colin. It's been a great conversation. Thanks very much, Matt. Thanks for having us on the show.